When I told my father I was hanging out here instead of my dad being like, oh, you have a problem. We should put you in a home or we should put you in rehab. He's like, you know, he looked at me, he goes, son, such a boomer response. He goes, you know, son, uh, 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 like a dirt bag bar has played a role in every Dylan's life. Your uncle Tommy had a place called Buckley's. I used to go to a place called my father's place. Like he would just, you know, and I'm like, great. This is, this is good. You know? It's like, son, you're, you're following a long tradition of people <laughs> that have made very bad choices <laughs> in a very similar way to the ones you're making right now. Lisa's Lounge. If you're in Baldwin, Long Island, stop in and have a pop. Have a cocktail. Many of the people I know are dead. That, uh, you know, I brought, did you come in there with me? Yeah, we went back, but I don't think you recognized anybody, right? No, because remember there was like a bunch of pictures on the wall of people mm -hmm. that are that are now dead. Yeah, and you're like, whatever happened to Trevor? And you're like, they were like, yeah, uh, throat cancer, went in a year. Sue, yeah. Sue died. Yeah. yeah. They lived hard. These people lived very hard. They, uh, they really didn't take care of themselves. Um, many of them chose the bar over their families and their, you know, it was, you know, alcoholism is very tough. Um, that being said, um, it was a lot of fun. There was a time there when we had a really good time. When you just say to yourself, let's just make the best of it. Every now and then somebody would stumble into that bar who didn't know what it was about. It was a place where you were, you were unable to enjoy it ironically, which is great. Like, you know, every now and then, like you'd see a hipster piece of shit walk in and try to like enjoy it ironically, but you couldn't do that because it was a, like, there was a woman, Jen, who used to hang out there and she had, uh, she had those diabetic shoes, those big shoes. And she would walk in and she was in a, she was in a group home, but she would get a day pass and then she would go out to Lisa's lounge and she was ill. She was mentally ill. So again, you'd feel uncomfortable automatically, like immediately if you came in there to, to just like, oh, it's such a dirty little dive bar. I'm just going to go in and have a little drink. Immediately, you would, you would be like, oh, this is really bad because all the horrors of the world were on full display as they should have been. Like Jen, for example, one day, Jen came in. There was a, a newer bartender. And this, was, this is a great story. Jen came in. Uh, I was there and the newer bartender was there. And Jen walked in and Jen goes, I'm having a party for the fire department here tonight. I need chafing dishes out. I need fucking, I need you to be ready. And the bartender was like, okay, all right. And, and I was just sitting there, me and a few other people were sitting there. We're all just kind of smiling, weren't really saying anything. And, you know, Jen walked in and she goes, we're having a, we're having a party for the fire department. They're all coming here tonight. And the bartender was like, okay, that seems strange, but hey, it's a local bar. This is what local bars do. They support the local, you know, first responders, okay? Um, so Jen set up all the chafing dishes and, and of course the food never came because there was no food. And then the firefighters never came because that was also not real. But Jen just got bombed and played pool by herself and played music from the jukebox and didn't seem to mind that no, no, nobody was actually there. She didn't address it. She never brought it up and nobody brought it up. And, and then the bartender just obviously stopped asking when they were arriving because she realized pretty quickly that Jen was mentally ill. And in Jen's mind, the bar was full of firefighters and she was having a great time and, and throwing a party. So it wasn't a place where like you could like go and um, you had to be down with that. You had to be down with drinking with crazy Jen. You had to be down or crazy Patty who came in. Crazy Patty had done some time in jail because she'd carved up another woman's face when they were children or maybe a man. I forget. But Patty. My grandmother taught Patty uh, in like fourth grade or something. Patty had um, and Patty's son called her once. And me and my friend Joe were there and Patty's son called her and Patty's son was like, mom. And we heard, we heard him say this over the phone. He said, mom, I'm in Vegas. I think I took too much of something. Mom, I'm in Vegas. I think I took too much. And she just looked and she goes, all right, honey, I'll see you later. And just hung up the phone. And then me her, her and my friend Joe did shots. You know, you had to be okay with that. If you weren't okay with, if you were going to be the type of person that said, is your son okay? You would have to leave.
you would have to leave at that point. If you couldn't enjoy or just at least make peace with the fact that, you know, this was the way it was. You show like, you know, all these speakeasies, like these bars that try to market themselves as speakeasies and all these fucking, you know, young professional millennials go there and they're like, ooh, this is what it was like to drink bathtub gin. You know, you know, Lisa's Lounge was a, was a real horror show. It was a real Rob Zombie movie. And you had to be okay with that. And we were okay. I was okay with it. It didn't, I didn't mind, you know, my friend Julie, uh, who I brought to Lisa's Lounge, who lived next to my friend Joe. And I said, hi, Julie, how are you? What happened? Uh, you know, what, 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 you know I, I don't know why I asked her what happened. Oh, because she said, my husband's in jail. And I said, well, what happened? She goes, well, let me give you the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> and I said, okay. And she goes, he came home one night. He was really on a bender. He tried to kill me. And then the cops got him three houses away. He was covered in my blood. <laughs> if that bothered you, you couldn't hang out there. You had to say, well, I'm glad things are going well today. Would you like a shot? And she always would want a shot. She was a fun woman. And you just had to be okay with that. But then every now and then there'd be people that would stumble in because they thought that it was like a fun little divey bar for them to like, you know, just kind of ironically enjoy, but you couldn't ironically enjoy it because you were surrounded by people who were dead serious. Like it wasn't a crowd of people. Like these were people that were dead serious. There was a guy named Bobby and his wife, Sally, and she would spit a, a, a Seroquel or some drug into his beer every night. So he would literally pass out. And that's the only way she could drag him out of the bar that he would wake up the next day is because she had to drug him every night. And you would, you would have to witness that and go, okay, okay. That's the way they live. You know, he choked once and Sally looked so happy because he was about to die. Literally, his name was Bobby Haha. He was like 50, but he looked 90. And he, he had a laugh like this. He'd go, ah! and he, he had the glass. He had the glass shop next to the bar. And every now and then he'd laugh. He'd go, ah! that's how he laughs. We call him Bobby Haha. He'd go, ah! and one night he almost died. And I mean, literally, I've never seen someone choke to the point where their air, their air was literally blocked, but he was so beat red. And it was at the point where he was no longer choking. He just started. And everyone at the bar was just kind of watching. Sally was just like, all right, he's done now, I guess. And then the bartender came up to his bartender, Tracy. And he goes, he finally, I don't know what the fuck happened. I think somebody smacked him on his back or whatever. And he just coughed up this like chicken wing, this chunk of meat that he'd been choking on. And as soon as he got enough air, he went like this. He went, <laughs> and he started laughing. And Tracy goes, Bobby, are you okay? And he looked at her and goes, you got a fat ass. Now, that was disturbing for a lot of people. And people couldn't have fun in that environment. A lot of people couldn't have fun in that environment. But I always thought it was fun and challenging. It was challenging, morally. Was that the same crowd at the helm? Yeah. Well, the crowd at the helm, the helm was an old fisherman bar and the helm had been around since like the sixties or seventies. And the helm had been flooded so many times. The, the, the floor was kind of warped. The wood had been warped. Um, the helm had the best cheeseburger I've ever had. It's still the best cheeseburger I've ever had. And I, I always wondered why I think it's cause they never cleaned the grill. I asked a guy once, I said, why is this burger the best? He's like, cause it's 3am and we're drunk. And I was like, well, that might be it. But it was really a great burger. If you're in, in Freeport, I don't know if it's the same, Go to the bar, get the burger, American cheese, sauteed onions. It's great. Uh, the helm, the helm had a very similar. There was a guy named Lou at the helm who hung out who didn't have a nose. <laughs> Set a hole in the middle of his face because he snorted his nose off. Um, it was the same type of people, but the helm was a little. People would more. People could kind of go to the helm and enjoy it because it was on the water. But not many of them, like, you know, we're talking about a group, we're, we're talking about like the difference between a person that's a lifer at a bar like this and a casual. And at least it was very hard to be a casual, uh, you know, you would really have to just resign yourself to what Lisa's lounge was, the power of the lounge. I just used to, my friends would call me and they go, where are you? I'm at the lounge. And then they would come. 
Um, and my friends would always come and enjoy it because they're, I mean, they're dirt bags. My friends were dirt bags. I love them all, but they were dirt bags. So that's why they liked it. They thought it was great. But every now and then the hell, you know, the hell might get some people in there that were not, that were just, you know, not aware of what it was and might have a drink, you know, on a Friday night at 6 PM and then leave and then go have dinner and not really get it. But the helm really came alive, you know, around, you know, midnight when it was just the people that really belonged there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joan, who was a great bartender, Joni, uh, you know, there were fights at the helm. People would smash glasses over each other's heads. It was, you know, it's it that type of place. It was just, you know, it was that type of crew, but a great burger. And many people have never spent any time in these bars. They've never spent time in bars like this, you know, like Ryan, what's his name? Philippi Felipe. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. do, how do you pronounce that name? I am not sure. He commented that he, he liked the last episode. I don't know if he listens a lot or he lives like a guy like that's probably not spent a ton of time in bars like this, you know, like, uh, you know, a, a guy that's a good, like a good looking Hollywood actor. Uh, yeah. He's probably not spent an inordinate amount of time in, a, in these blood boxes, nor should he have, I, I, you know, this is, this is, you know, but it's like, there are people out there that just never true. And, and some of them will just go to a bar like this once and they don't, they don't just settle into it and become a regular to be a regular at a bar like this changes you a little bit because, you know, when I was growing up, like the thing about when I was growing up, and doing a lot of drugs, you would like the type of poverty I saw had a lot to do with drugs. Like the people that didn't have money or that didn't have, and I'm not saying all poverty has to do with that. Most of it does not. So don't fucking you know, tell me like, well, <laughs> I'm saying that what I, because I was a druggie, the situations that I got myself into and, you know, when I would, when I would go and hang out at a, 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 you know, a crack house or whatever you want to call it, a house where they were selling cocaine and, you know, three or four families were living in this little house and, you know, you know, it was largely drugs and people just didn't have good jobs and they, they weren't saving for their retirement, you know, and it, none of that was happening because they were on drugs and they were selling drugs. They were, they were, you know, going out with somebody who sold drugs. This is how they were earning a living. It's how they were making money. And, and of course there were, you know, people, you know, you, and there were kids around and it was shitty. It was sad because a lot of those, a lot of those kids, you know, would bother you. They would just bought, we were all trying to do drugs. And a lot of these kids would just bother you all the time because they were, children are very selfish, but it was also sad that, you know, they weren't going to have a shot at life, blah, blah, blah. But it is very, <laughs> I didn't do it, but you would feel bad. You'd feel morally like, ugh, because you'd be doing Coke in a room. And then in another room, like somebody had a baby. And you're like, oh, that baby is not going to have a lot of advantages that that baby should have. You know, I mean, it's just. So when you become a regular at, at these bars, you, you really see you want to talk about like the middle class. You see what happens when people don't have a career, when they have a job and when they don't make enough money and they don't have a stable living situation and they don't have any community of people. They find a community and they're also an alcoholic. The community becomes the bar. They, they go out to the bar. Uh, they network at the bar. If somebody needs somebody to help them with something, if they need an apartment, they ask around at the bar, this becomes their group, you know? So, being in these, you know, bars and spending time there and kind of becoming a regular there, I would see that. And I myself, you know, would, you know, I'd be like, Hey, do you got a guy for this? You got, you know, somebody who does this. It was like, these were people that, you know, unfortunately some of them had kids, some of them had wives, but this is, you know, the choice that they made. They, they, they just spent a lot of time and their, their entire life revolved around their addiction and their addiction uh, their addictions, you know, destroyed their lives and they destroyed their families and they destroyed their careers and they destroyed their communities. Um, and that, unless you're a regular at a place like that, and unless you see people over a span of time, it's hard to understand that. 
you know, if you if you need, go get a potato and put a Marlboro Light in its mouth and watch that and then press play on your phone. 